Good afternoon, everyone. My name's Richard Lester, and I'm head of the Nuclear Science and Engineering Department. And it's my great pleasure to welcome all of you to this 11th David J. Rose Lecture in Nuclear Technology. And we're very proud to have with us today to deliver the lecture Dr. John Holdren, the President's Science Advisor and Director of the White House Office of Science and Technology Policy. In a couple of minutes, I'm going to call on President Susan Hockfield to introduce our speaker. But first, I'd like to briefly remember the man whom we honor with this lecture. This institute has its eyes set firmly on the future. That's as it should be, and it's what we're about. But even here at MIT, it's good every now and again to celebrate our past and especially for the benefit of the uh, many nuclear science and engineering students that I see here in the room. I'd like to recall Professor David Rose's important role in the history of our department <coughs> because Professor Rose was truly a pioneer in ways that we may perhaps be better appreciate, uh, able to appreciate today uh, than ever before. He was, first of all, a pioneer in controlled nuclear fusion. Second, he was a pioneer in the field of energy technology and policy assessment. From his vantage point within the nuclear engineering department, as it then was, Professor Rose more or less founded the field of interdisciplinary energy studies at MIT. In the 1970s, he created a course on energy technology assessment, which survives to this day it's now called Sustainable Energy. Uh, then it was just called Energy. <coughs> and indeed, the course has now been incorporated into the uh, energy <coughs> minor, the new energy uh, undergraduate energy minor that has been established here uh, at the Institute. It's also worthy of note that in the late 70s and, and uh, early 1980s, David and his students conducted uh, one of the earliest assessments of the relationship between energy systems and global climate change. So that was the second area in which David was a pioneer. And third, he was a leader in building bridges between the scientific and the theological communities. David's presence in the department at a time of great social turbulence surrounding the development of nuclear science and technology helped us to develop a coherent response as educators and researchers to the societal dimensions of the technologies and systems that we work on. He helped us to understand that in order to be effective engineers and scientists, we need to incorporate those societal dimensions into the practice of our discipline and into the teaching of it. And these ideas, David's ideas, continue to influence us today as we lay the foundations for the next phase of development of our department and of the future of the field of nuclear science and engineering. And I think that these same lessons are also being uh, absorbed today into other fields of engineering, both here at MIT and elsewhere. As it happens, it is today exactly 25 years and one day since David passed away. And it's especially fitting that on this anniversary, we have John Holdren with us to deliver the Rose Lecture. There is no one on the national scene today who better represents the intellectual excellence, the engagement with public policy, and the moral compass that David pursued in his own life and that he strove to impart to his students in his all too short career as a scientist and an educator. We also have with us today several members of David's family who in some cases have traveled great distances to be here. Two of his children, Elizabeth Rose and Andrew Rose, his wife, the Reverend Renata Rose, and her sister, Brigitta Grime, as well as a number of David's colleagues from around the world. We welcome all of you on this special day. And before uh, Professor Ho uh, Pre President Hockfield speaks, I'd like to call on uh, Renata Rose uh, to say just a few words uh, of introduction uh, to this lecture.
As Richard mentioned, yesterday was the 25th anniversary of my husband's death, and I am very grateful for the department and to Dr. Holdren for, to arrange and choose this lecture today. I'd like to say a few words about how I see David's leg legacy, which I think is as relevant today as it was 25 years ago. David constantly asks the question, how can science, especially nuclear science and technology, contribute to the common good, to the well-being of society, not only here, but uh, in the world at large. And the students in the audience, I'm sure, want to know, has the scientific community actually taken responsibility to confront openly the challenge of dealing with such issues as nuclear waste disposal, proliferation, and disarmament? David always emphasized the connections, and he was convinced that nuclear power would not be accepted by the public unless we get rid of nuclear weapons. Environmental and ethical concerns were foremost on David's mind and are clearly explained in his book, Learning About Energy which examines all forms of energy production and asks the question, nuclear power compared to what? David believed that nuclear power, because of its safety problems, cannot be expected to be a very profitable and money-making enterprise. Therefore, he called on the government and on the nuclear industry to be willing to pay whatever it takes to guarantee its safety. And he called on his colleagues at MIT and um, elsewhere to give guidance in communicating these difficult decisions to the public. I'm sure Dr. Holdren will shed light on these problems and tell us what he hopes to accomplish in the next few years. Thank you. Well, thank you, Mrs. Rose. Um, Richard, I want to thank you for hosting the David J. Rose Lecture today, and I want to thank all of you for joining us, uh, particularly uh, Professor Rose's family and friends. Welcome to MIT. Welcome back to MIT. Um, in President Obama's inauguration speech, he promised to return science to its rightful place. And in appointing Dr. John Holdren to serve as his chief science advisor, he moved the nation importantly in that direction. Dr. Holdren serves as assistant to the president for science and technology, director of the White House Office of Science and Technology Policy, and co-chair of the President's Council of Advisors on Science and Technology which we know as PCAST. <clears throat> he brings to this work a remarkable record of achievement with an unusual span from the frontiers of scientific research to the upper echelons of national policy leadership. To describe all of his contributions uh, would be a lecture in and of itself, but since we want to hear from him and not only about him, I will attempt to capture his contributions briefly. First, John Holdren, the scholar can't leave out this part because he earned his bachelor's and master's degrees from MIT in aeronautics and astronautics. And following that, he went to Stanford for a PhD in aer aerospace engineering and theoretical plasma physics. In 1973, shortly after he joined the faculty at UC Berkeley, he co-founded and co-led a new interdisciplinary graduate program in energy and resources. In 1981, the first year the MacArthur Genius Grants were awarded, he was decorated with one. In 1996, he joined Harvard's Kennedy School of Government as the Teresa and John Heinz Professor of Environmental Policy and Director of the Program on Science, Technology, and Public Policy, as well as a professor in Harvard's Department of Earth and Planetary Sciences. 
From 2005 to 2009, he also served as director of the Woods Hole Research Center. He has authored or co-authored more than 200 articles and papers and 20 books and book-length reports. Among his numerous honors, he's a member of the National Academy of Sciences, the National Academy of Engineering, and the American Academy of Arts and Sciences. Dr. Holdren has intertwined his distinguished academic career with equally remarkable contributions to public policy in fields of particular interest to this audience and this lecture. From 1994 to 2001, he served as a member of President Clinton's Council of Advisors on Science and Technology, and he chaired reports concerned with the interlocked issues of nuclear arms and nuclear power. From 1993 to 2004, he augmented that work by chairing the National Academies Committee on International Security and Arms Control. In 2003, he helped frame MIT's report on the future of nuclear energy. In March 2009, he became Chief Science Advisor to President Obama by unanimous confirmation of the U.S. Senate. Dr. Holdren has turned the Office of Science and Technology Policy into a dynamic idea zone for new science and technology policies. And though it's hard to imagine how Dr. Holdren manages to accomplish so much and to be in so many places, he has honored, honored us several times since he took office in the White House by coming to MIT to share his insights and wisdom with us. His pioneering leadership on energy, technology, and policy, and on global climate change place him at the heart of the concerns of, the David, of David Rose himself. Today, Dr. Holdren will speak to us on the energy climate change challenge and the role of nuclear energy in meeting it. Please join me in welcoming an individual whose life's work beautifully reflects MIT's commitment to advancing knowledge in service to the world, Dr. John Holdren. Well, thank you very much, President Hockfield, members of the Rose family, uh, colleagues, and friends. It is certainly uh, a great privilege uh, and an honor to be here to give the David J. Rose lecture. Uh, I had the pleasure of knowing Professor Rose. Uh, first, I knew him uh, by remote control. I read his book, Plasmas and Controlled Fusion, Rose and Clark, uh, not long after it came out, while I was an undergraduate at MIT. And it steered me in the direction of going into plasma physics uh, and controlled fusion. I also had the pleasure of working with David Rose when both of us were members of the steering committee uh, of a gigantic National Academy study uh, called the Committee on Nuclear and Alternative Energy Systems. It was really about the energy future of the United States. Uh, it took place from 1975 to 1979. Uh, he and I worked very closely uh, in that connection, it was enormously labor-intensive uh, study. Uh, we became friends as well as colleagues, and I learned uh, an immense amount from him uh, person to person on top of all I'd learned uh, from his writings. As has already been uh, mentioned here, he was a most extraordinary individual with uh, very uh, far-seeing ideas about science, technology, and the human condition, and about the importance of interdisciplinary approaches to understanding the relationships among science, technology, and the human condition. This passage uh, on the screen is uh, from the first few lines of his book with Melville Clark, uh, Plasmas and Controlled Fusion. Of course, he started out that book with the largest context uh, into which the uh, issues of nuclear energy uh, need to be seen and need to fit. Uh, I'm going to try to cover this uh, topic with uh, suitable breadth, given uh, the function of, of honoring and remembering uh, Professor David Rose. I'll talk first about the character of the energy challenge and what I regard as the two toughest problems within that challenge, namely how to meet transport needs with less oil and how to meet economic aspirations with less carbon dioxide. I'll talk about what needs to be done in those domains, about what the Obama administration is doing, and I'll focus at the end particularly on the role of nuclear fission and nuclear fusion, both topics obviously of great interest uh, to David Rose during his career. Starting with the character of the challenge, I start really with where we've been and then say a few words about where we're going and why it's problematic. 
uh, the last 150 years depicted here in terms of the world's energy supply uh, saw a 20-fold increase in the world's use of energy. The green at the bottom are the biomass energy resources, mostly traditional biomass, fuel wood, charcoal, crop waste, and dung, still the primary energy sources for two billion of the world's poorest people. Uh, even that expanded over this 150-year period, but what you see is that most of the growth was driven in the first 100 years by the expansion of oil, shown here in brown, and uh, in the last 50 years, at twice the rate of growth, the expansion of oil and natural gas. Nuclear is a little red wedge in the middle, hydropower an even smaller blue wedge. If you look at where we were just a couple of years ago in 2008, uh, 2009, a bit of an aberration because of the world economic crunch, so I showed 2008 here. In terms of population, purchasing power parity corrected gross domestic product in trillions, energy use in exajoules, fossil dependence in percent of primary energy coming from the fossil sources, and finally emissions of fossil carbon dioxide, that is carbon dioxide derived from fossil fuel combustion measured in millions of tons of contained carbon, you see what to many people is a rather shocking picture. Even in 2008, the world remained more than 80% dependent on fossil fuels. The uh, dependence in China and the United States, the world's two largest uh, energy consuming countries, even higher than the world average uh, of 82%. Russia, 91% uh, dependent on fossil fuel. Only India has a modest uh, roughly two-thirds fossil fuel dependence, in large part because of the continuing very large role of the traditional biomass fuels uh, in that country. If you look at where we're headed under what is often called business as usual, which doesn't mean nothing changes, it just means things continue to change in the same pattern with which they have recently been changing, you see that uh, by 2030, energy use increases uh, about 60% above uh, the 2005 level electricity, about 75%, and fossil fuels continue to dominate. Under business as usual, you see in this picture, fossil fuels will still be uh, over 70% of world energy use in 2030. Ask what's problematic about this future. Most people will say, well, we're going to run out of energy, but that is not the case. The problem is not running out of energy in any absolute sense. Uh, these particular units are terawatt years uh, of energy. The current rate of world energy use is 17 terawatts or 17 terawatt years per year. Uh, and so you can compare that with the uh, estimated amounts of remaining recoverable conventional oil and gas, unconventional oil and gas larger still, coal larger than that, uh, methane clathrates, should we ever figure out how to exploit them economically, larger still, oil shale even bigger. The nuclear fuels, 2,000 terawatt years in round numbers from uranium in conventional reactors, probably 1,000 times more in breeder reactors, that is uh, 100 times more per kilogram of uranium and 10 times more kilograms made available because you can use much more dilute ores. You could even use seawater if you had to to fuel uh, breeder reactors. Fusion. Uh, if the technology succeeds, uh, larger still, uh, enough energy to run a world far more energy intensive than today's for much longer than the expected lifetime of the sun. That's effectively an inexhaustible uh, energy source, as uh, Professor Rose uh, was fond of pointing out. Renewable energy sources in available energy per year, 30,000 terawatt years per year, hitting just the land surface of the Earth, 2,000 terawatt years per year in the wind, 120 in photosynthesis. We're not running out of energy on any interesting time scale or on a global basis. And we're also not running out of money. The next thing people ask is, can we afford to keep building energy facilities at a pace that would maintain this business as usual? This shows projected capital investment for energy supply from 2001 to 2030. Uh, figures developed uh, by the International Energy Agency in the uh, OECD, uh, but these are figures for the world. The total investment over this period estimated to be about $16 trillion. It would be somewhat higher now because the capital costs of many of these facilities have escalated, but the fact is that this would be in the range 
of 1% of projected gross world product for the period, only about 5% of projected world investment. It could be a problem in developing countries where by their very nature capital is short, but for the world as a whole, we could easily uh, afford to pay for this. The real problems start, I think, with the economic, political, and security risks of fossil fuel dependence and extend into a variety of very serious and difficult environmental problems. Increasing dependence on imported oil and natural gas means economic vulnerability as well as international tensions and even the prospect of conflict over access and terms of access. Coal burning for electricity and industry and oil burning in, in, in vehicles are the main sources of urban air pollution and regional air pollution, oxides of sulfur, oxides of nitrogen, hydrocarbons, and soot, with large impacts on public health and acid precipitation worldwide. And the emissions of carbon dioxide from all fossil fuel burning, the coal, the oil, the natural gas, are the largest driver of what I think we should be calling not global warming but global climate disruption, already being associated with increasing harm to human well-being and rapidly getting worse. The further difficulty here is that all of the alternatives to conventional fossil fuels have liabilities and limitations of various kinds. I hasten to say before I show you the list, this doesn't mean we shouldn't use any of them. It just means there's no free lunch out there. There's no silver bullet. Traditional biofuels, which I've already mentioned, fuel wood, charcoal, crop waste, and dung, create a huge indoor air pollution hazard being burned in crude stoves in inadequately ventilated indoor environments across the developing countries. Industrial biofuels can take land from forests and food production and increase food prices. Hydropower and wind, limited by the availability of, of suitable locations and conflicts over siting. I should say we're all in this country familiar with the phenomenon NIMBY, not in my backyard. We used to think that was confined to nuclear power plants and oil refineries. But now, having been in a struggle for over eight years on Cape Cod to site a wind farm, I have been convinced that the appropriate acronym is now not NIMBY, but BANANA. BANANA stands for build absolutely nothing anywhere near anybody. Uh, 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 solar energy uh, is uh, both costly with current technology and intermittent. Uh, nuclear fission, which of course we'll talk more about, has large requirements for capital and highly trained personnel currently lacks agreed solutions for radioactive waste and managing the links to nuclear weaponry. Nuclear fusion, alas, doesn't work yet as an energy source. It's a wonderful energy sink. Fusion machines uh, buy and use a lot of energy, but they don't yet produce more than they use. Uh, coal to gas and coal to liquids as a way to reduce oil and gas imports. We've got a lot of coal and we could do that, but they roughly double carbon dioxide emissions per unit of delivered fuel energy. And increasing end-use efficiency, which most people recognize as the cleanest, safest, fastest, cheapest, surest new source of energy, nonetheless, uh, is limited by the fact that it needs educated consumers. Ultimately, billions of consumers have to make intelligent decisions, and that requires education, and that is a limiting factor on uh, end-use efficiency. The two toughest problems, in my view, in this whole constellation of challenges associated with energy are number one, how we can reduce the urban and regional air pollution and the dangers of overdependence on oil despite growing global demand from the transportation system. Transportation system accounts for most oil use in the United States and elsewhere. Transportation demands for oil are growing rapidly. All of the problems associated with it growing apace, this is an enormous challenge. The second of the two toughest problems, and I think harder still, is how we provide the affordable energy that's needed to create and sustain prosperity everywhere in the countries that are already rich and the countries that are rapidly becoming richer. How we do that without wrecking the global climate with carbon dioxide emitted from fossil fuel burning in a world where we're still getting more than 80% of that energy from those fossil fuels. So let me elaborate briefly uh, on these problems before turning to what we're doing and what the role of nuclear fission and fusion might be. Uh, most of you are familiar with these numbers. I'll go through them very quickly. In my reference year of 2008, the United States alone was using 21 million barrels a day of oil and importing about two-thirds of it. The business-as-usual future had that oil use rising to 28 million barrels a day by 2030 with all of the increase, all of the increase 
coming from imports. The world was using 82 million barrels a day in 2008, almost two-thirds of that being traded internationally. Consumption was forecasted to rise to 120 million barrels a day by 2030. China's imports by 2030 were expected to pass 12 million barrels a day, about what the United States was importing in uh, 2000. And it remains true that most of the world's known and suspected oil resources are in one of the most politically unstable regions in the world, the Middle East. Just to emphasize this point that transport accounts for most world oil use, this is the use of oil uh, worldwide, historically and projected into the future for electricity generation, almost none. Very little oil used for electricity generation anymore. Transportation, that great wide orange band, and then industrial, commercial, and residential uses, transportation overwhelmingly the dominant source of oil use. What's it doing to the environment? Most of it's used in transport vehicles. As we've seen, they're the largest sources of oxides of nitrogen and hydrocarbon air pollution. Number of cars in the world is soaring, producing increased congestion and thereby even more uh, pollution than if there were less congestion. I was in Beijing 10 days ago. It's gridlocked uh, most of the time. And you can't see the hills and mountains surrounding Beijing most of the time. In fact, often you can't see the buildings half a mile away in Beijing. And the number of cars registered in Beijing has recently been increasing at between 30 and 50 percent per year, if you can imagine that. The combustion of petroleum fuels accounts for something in the range of 40 percent of the CO2 emissions from energy, about the same as coal, and that's expected to continue under business as usual. If you just look at the problem of acid precipitation, this shows wet and dry reactive nitrogen deposition from the atmosphere on the left in the early 90s, in the right projected for 2050. All you have to know about the scale is that yellow is worse, orange is terrible, brown is awful. And you look at the uh, projected uh, patterns of deposition for 2050, uh, this is a huge uh, potential problem for the world. Turning to climate change, the essence of the matter is that global climate is changing rapidly compared to natural variations that have occurred over geologic time. Humans are almost without doubt responsible for most of the change. Carbon dioxide emissions are the largest driver of that change. And 75 to 85 percent of those carbon dioxide emissions are coming from the combustion of fossil fuels. The rest, most of the rest, except for a bit from cement production, is coming from deforestation, largely in the tropics. Those fossil carbon dioxide emissions are immense in absolute quantity, about 31 billion tons of CO2 per year in 2008, difficult by virtue of that enormous volume to capture and to store. And the further aspect of this challenge, which many people, uh, I think, underrate, is that our fossil fuel dependent global energy system, 80 percent fossil fuel dependent system, represents a capital investment in the neighborhood of $15 trillion. That is, that's what it would cost you if you had to replace all the power plants, transmission lines, oil refineries, pipelines, coal mines in the world. You'd have to invest $15 trillion. And ordinarily, that $15 trillion investment takes 30 to 40 years to turn over. You can't turn over a $15 trillion investment overnight, no matter how badly you want to do it. And that means if we want the energy system to look very different in 2050 than it looks today, we need to start changing it now. And the bottom line in this climate change challenge is that avoiding the biggest risks from climate change requires that we start sharply reducing the ratio of carbon dioxide released to energy used, starting essentially immediately. Just a few points from climate science. There's no question that the Earth is getting hotter. This is the global land and ocean temperature index out to 2009, which was the second hottest year in the uh, roughly 130-year instrumental record. That is the, the thermometer record. Before 1880, there weren't enough thermometers uh, around to define a meaningful global average. That's why the thermometer record starts in, in 1880. Uh, 2007 tied with 1998 for third place. The 15 hottest years in the whole 130 all occurred since 1990. And we know why. This is a pretty busy diagram, but it conveys a very important conclusion. The top shows uh, our current best understanding of the forcings on climate. Forcing, for those who are not climatologists, literally means how hard we're pushing on the climate by various things we do. 
You don't have to worry much about the units there. The uh, forcing by greenhouse gases is the red line rising steadily uh, through the picture. This is the same 130 years of the thermometer record that's being uh, reflected here. The blue lines going downward are volcanic eruptions, which throw fine particles into the atmosphere and temporarily cool the Earth, so they're negative forcing. The solar uh, forcing, as best we understand it, is there. And what is on the bottom is both the observed temperatures over this 105 years and the results of computer simulations that were fed these forcings, the natural forcings, the human forcings, uh, and the match is very good indeed. It's hard to look at this and imagine that we don't have a pretty good handle on who is doing what and to whom in terms of the influences on the climate that are changing the average temperature of the Earth. Furthermore, this is not a problem just for our children and grandchildren. Harm is already occurring. Around the world, we're seeing variously increases in floods, in wildfires, in droughts, in heat waves, pest outbreaks, coral bleaching events, the power of the strongest typhoons and hurricanes, the geographic range of tropical pathogens, and all of this plausibly linked to climate change by theory, by models, and by observed fingerprints. That is, the patterns in which these things are changing are pretty much as predicted the patterns would change under the influence of increasing quantities of greenhouse gases in the atmosphere. Bigger impacts are in store if we continue on the business as usual trajectory. This shows uh, two centuries, 1900 to 2000, the history, and then 2000 to 2100, various projections of the Intergovernmental Panel on Climate Change. You see that the mid-range of those projections soars through the two degrees C increase in global average temperature at about 2050. The last time the world was that warm was 130,000 years ago. At that time, sea level was four to six meters higher than it is today. By the end of the century we're now in, 2100, the middle of the range is three degrees Celsius above the 1900 level. The last time it was that warm was 30 million years ago. At that time, there were crocodiles swimming off of Greenland, palm trees in Wyoming, a uh, very different world. Uh, and sea level was 20 to 30 meters higher than today. That's not to say that sea level will reach those levels as soon as the temperature reaches that level. The, the lag in the ice disappearing is generally in the range of thousands of years, but we will come back to the point of how fast the sea level could go up. What's expected in the future uh, is a, gr a, a great deal more of all the kinds of harm we're already seeing. Hotter summer, this shows the uh, percentage of summers warmer than the current 95th percentile warm summers around the world under a two degree C global average warming. You see most of the world will have 90% uh, of their summers or more uh, hotter than the current 95th uh, percentile. Uh, crop yields uh, for small temperature increases do all right, but they start to drop uh, after that. These are uh, the most recent simulations of uh, declines in crop yields with increasing temperature from uh, a report by the National Academies uh, out this year. And the longer term, this is my favorite uh, sea level diagram because it's animated. This was produced uh, by a former doctoral student of mine, now Dr. Jeff Balicki. Um, the current estimates indicate that sea level could rise by as much as one to two meters by 2100 three to 12 meters in the next few hundred years, up to 70 meters eventually. And this just shows the consequences for uh, the area uh, in which we sit uh, of those various degrees of sea level rise. What do we need to do? Well, with respect to oil, there are a lot of obvious things to do. Strengthen vehicle fuel economy standards. Provide incentives to both manufacturers and consumers to promote domestic production and increased use of advanced vehicles of a variety of kinds. Accelerate the development and deployment of non-petroleum transportation fuel alternatives, picking the ones that, uh, for example, don't compete with food and don't cause us to cut down our tropical forests. Improve and promote rail and other public transportation and land use planning for shorter commutes. And build international cooperation to promote alternatives to expanded oil use everywhere. This is a problem uh, we cannot solve by ourselves, just as the climate problem is, and I turn to that. Now, in terms of climate change, we have only three options. Mitigation, the things we can do to reduce the pace and magnitude of the climate change that occurs. Adaptation, meaning measures you take to reduce 
the adverse impacts on human well-being resulting from changes that you do not avoid through mitigation. And the third option is suffering. Suffering the adverse impacts that are not avoided by either mitigation or adaptation. Those are the options. <clears throat> and they're both essential. No feasible amount of mitigation can stop climate change in its tracks. Adaptation efforts are already taking place and we're going to need to expand them. We're already doing some of both. We're already doing some mitigation. We're already doing some adaptation. What's at stake is the future mix of mitigation, adaptation, and suffering. And a key point is that adaptation becomes costlier, more difficult, and less effective as the magnitude of the changes to which you're trying to adapt grows. And that means <clears throat> that what we need is enough mitigation to avoid an unmanageable degree of climate change and enough adaptation to manage the degree of climate change that is not avoidable. Lots of possibilities for adaptation. Change what we grow and where we grow it. Develop heat, drought, and salt-resistant crops. <clears throat> Strengthen public health and environmental engineering defenses against tropical diseases. New water projects for flood control and drought management. Dikes and storm surge barriers against sea level rise. Avoiding further development on floodplains and near sea level. And the important point is a lot of these things are worth doing anyway. They're win-wins. They're things we, we would want to do <clears throat> even if we weren't worried about climate change. I'm in some need of a glass of water. Could such a thing be arranged? <clears throat> I'm losing my voice up here. Um, apologies for that, but I will careen ahead. Uh, mitigation possibilities. Number of things that we're obviously going to do. Reduce emissions of greenhouse gases and soot. Black soot, which absorbs sunlight and also heats the atmosphere and the earth from the energy sector. Reduce deforestation. Increase reforestation and afforestation. Modify agricultural practices to reduce emissions of greenhouse gases and build up soil carbon. Some other things we might do, we might do geoengineering, so-called to create cooling effects to offset greenhouse heating. The most innocuous form of this is making roofs and pavement white instead of black, so they reflect energy rather than absorb it. There are much more ambitious and controversial schemes as well that might ultimately be contemplated uh, if we get desperate enough. Oh, thank you. Cough drop might do it, yes. Uh, and we could, in principle, scrub greenhouse gases from the atmosphere technologically, uh, make artificial trees. Ah, I see some water uh, approaching. <coughs> Please do come. Thank you very much. Splash it all over the computer, that would be the end, yeah. A tricky business. So the question is, how much mitigation do we in fact need? Oops. Did that wrong. Well, I need to find slideshows starting from the current place. Let me try this. Yes, there we go. We did that already. Okay, how much mitigation is enough? If we were to be able to stabilize the concentration of greenhouse gases and particles in the atmosphere at the equivalent of 550 parts per million of carbon dioxide, that would give you about a 50% chance of staying under a temperature increase of 3 degrees C. A decade ago, people thought that might be good enough. At the pace at which harmful effects are appearing, even at today's uh, much lower level, uh, it's becoming pretty clear that uh, 550 parts per million, 3 degrees C, is unlikely to avoid an unmanageable degree of climate change. Uh, and it's being more and more widely concluded that 450 parts per million of CO2 equivalent, which gives you about a 50% chance of staying below 2 degrees C, would be a more prudent level. Not a guarantee, obviously, of no harmful effects. We're already experiencing harmful effects with the carbon dioxide uh, at about 390, and the carbon dioxide equivalent, quite similar because it turns out that the effects of the various non-CO2 influences are roughly canceling out. To achieve that, to stabilize at 450 parts per million of CO2 uh, alone, requires that global emissions in total 
would level off by about 2020 and decline thereafter to 50 percent below 2,000 emissions by 2050. And under the assumption that the developing countries are going to need at least somewhat longer before they're able to stabilize and start to decline, if you assume that the developing countries are not going to do that until 2025, then the industrialized countries need to be doing it by about 2015, and they need to decline even more steeply to about 80 percent below year 2000 emissions by 2050, and that is roughly the goal that President Obama uh, has enunciated. Now, just a few realities about the uh, challenge of meeting that target. If one uh, is to stabilize at 450 parts per million of CO2 equivalent, it means that the CO2 emissions themselves in 2050 must be at least 7 to 9 billion tons of contained carbon per year below business as usual. That's it. That is a cut of 50 percent or more from what business as usual would be by then. If we stayed on the current trajectory, we would have twice or more as much CO2 as is compatible with a target of uh, having a 50 percent chance of staying below 2 degrees C. To understand what 7 to 9 gigatons of carbon per year contained in CO2 means, here are some examples of what it takes to avoid 1 billion tons. Again, keep in mind, we need to avoid 7 to 9 by 2050. If all the world's buildings were to use 20 to 25 percent less energy, all the residences, all the commercial buildings in the world were to use 20 to 25 percent less energy than is forecasted under business as usual, which already includes a lot of efficiency improvement, that would save 1 gigaton of carbon per year. If 2 billion cars got 60 miles a gallon instead of 30 miles a gallon, that would save 1 gigaton per year, 1 7th or 1 9th of what you need. If 800 large coal burning power plants, 1 electrical gigawatt, million kilowatt electric coal burning power plants, 800 of them capture and store their CO2 with very high efficiency, that avoids 1 gigaton. If we build 700 new nuclear power plants of a gigawatt each, which all replace coal burning power plants which would have released their CO2, that's one gigaton per year of carbon. A million two megawatt wind turbines or 2,000 one gigawatt photovoltaic power plants replacing coal power plants is one gigaton per year. Clearly you want to get seven or nine gigatons. You have to do all of these things and some more. So this is a big challenge in terms of the magnitude of the activity that's required. Here's a <coughs> somewhat more sophisticated approach to looking at what we need to do, how fast. This is a supply curve for avoided greenhouse gas emissions for the globe, which in total shows across the whole horizontal axis how much we need to reduce CO2 emissions by 2030 to be on this trajectory that stabilizes at 450 parts per million, 50 percent chance of staying below 2 degrees C. The items below the zero are activities that actually make money under current circumstances. That is, the amount of energy they save, for example, is worth more than the cost of implementing them. So those are things that, in principle, in an economically rational world, we'd be doing already that would have the effect of reducing CO2 emissions but would have other benefits, which is why we'd be doing them even in the absence of any economic incentive currently uh, to reduce these emissions. The uh, items that have bars extending above the line are things you have to pay for. That is, there's a net cost of using these measures. And they're all measured in dollars per ton of carbon dioxide equivalent. And the most expensive ones are up around $75 or $80 uh, per ton of CO2 equivalent. You can argue about whether the numbers are all exactly right, but it's a quite useful heuristic for understanding uh, the options. And the way I like to think about what this tells us about policy needs is shown here. I like the fruit tree metaphor. The stuff that already pays is low-hanging fruit or fruit that's lying on the ground, and the only problem is a fence around the tree in the form of a variety of barriers to getting at that low-hanging fruit and the fruit on the ground. And those barriers are information barriers, they're financing barriers, they're perverse incentives of a variety of kinds. We can get rid of those through policies, uh, get rid of the barriers to picking the low-hanging fruit. In the middle range, 
what one has is a variety of options that would become attractive if we had a modest price on greenhouse gas emissions. And there, what we need is to embed such a price in national and global policy. So there is an economic incentive reflecting the social cost of putting this stuff in the atmosphere that produces an incentive to do these somewhat more expensive measures. On the far right are measures that would be too expensive even under the modest charges for greenhouse gas emissions that are likely to be implemented uh, over the next 20 years. And so what you need there is research and development and demonstration to lower that highest hanging fruit into reach. So we have a three-pronged set of needs in energy policy, essentially barrier busting, incentives to reach higher into the tree, and research development and demonstration to lower the highest hanging fruit into reach. So what are we doing in this domain? Well, the strategy is, first of all, to try to promote recognition that the problem is real and that acting sooner is preferable to acting later. That's partly because the longer we wait, the bigger the damages will become and the more rapid the reductions that will be needed to stabilize the atmosphere. Prudent action is going to be cheaper than inaction or delay. We can reduce costly and risky oil imports and dangerous air pollution with many of the same measures that we employ to reduce the climate disrupting emissions. And there's an interesting and I think quite good argument that says that the needed surge of innovation in clean energy technologies and energy efficiency that we're going to need to do this will in fact create new businesses, new jobs, help drive economic recovery and growth and maintain global competitiveness. Another way of saying that last line is if we don't figure out how to reduce these emissions economically, other people will do so and will be selling the technologies to us. Now, I got out of order here, so we'll just put them all in. Let's see. So what we've been doing to try to get this done, a number of aspects of this, uh, providing new funding and initiatives for energy research, development, demonstration, and deployment for climate change research and adaptation. We've been revitalizing the U.S. Global Change Research Program and other interagency efforts, trying to work with Congress. That's been a challenge to get comprehensive energy and climate legislation that would put a price on greenhouse gas emissions and working with other countries to build cooperation in clean energy technology and to develop individual and joint climate policies that are consistent with avoiding the unmanageable. Some of the initiatives, the Recovery Act, uh, had $80 billion for clean and efficient energy in it, including efficient transportation. The new ARPA-E, the Advanced Research Projects Agency for Energy, got $400 million in the Recovery Act for 2009 and 10. Budget proposal by the President for 2011 is $300 million more. Variety of other increases uh, in the Department of Energy's budget. All applied energy R&D in the President's 2011 request would be $3.9 billion, a 7% increase. Energy Frontier Research Centers would get $140 million, the Energy Innovation Hubs $107 million, Basic Energy Science is up 12%. If you look at the history of applied energy technology research development and demonstration uh, over the period from 1978 to 2011, you see that we have been gradually coming up again, except for a very rapid boost in the, in the Recovery Act. Uh, period, and of course many people are wondering what we do for an encore when the Recovery Act money runs out. Virtually everybody who studies this concludes that we should be spending something in the range of three to four times as much on energy research development and demonstration in the federal government as we are now, as well as providing additional incentive to the private sector <coughs> to do more in this domain. <coughs> there are a lot of things that different agencies uh, are doing that don't require the consent of the Congress. EPA and Department of Transportation, of course, <coughs> announced last year new fuel economy and CO2 tailpipe standards uh, for the first time. That is, combining uh, fuel economy and greenhouse gas emissions. And new standards, as reported in this morning's newspaper, uh, so I can say it now, are coming uh, for medium duty and heavy duty trucks. EPA's endangerment finding, of course, uh, NOAA restructuring uh, to consolidate all its activities related to what are now being called climate services, sort of analogous to the weather service, 
uh, to provide the information that people need to effectively adapt to climate change. Department of Interior has been restructuring to develop climate change response centers uh, and so on. Uh, partnership for Sustainable Communities going on among transportation, housing, and urban development in EPA. Broad interagency efforts, there are a variety of these. Uh, time is running on, so I'm not going to say too much about this, except that the President said to the very first Cabinet meeting, the only kind of bad news I'm not prepared to hear from you people is that you're not cooperating. He said, you can tell me whatever other bad news I need to hear, but don't tell me you're not cooperating because the challenges are too big and our resources too meager to be able to afford non-cooperation. It was very clear in that instruction, and so we're doing a lot to build up interagency uh, efforts on the energy and climate front. In terms of national climate change legislation, President Obama was emphatic that that legislation should include climate. Uh, that was not sufficient. We re reluctantly and temporarily abandoned uh, that hope because of insufficient support in the Senate, but we will be back. We are going to try in the next Congress. Again, the President uh, has been making that clear. And in the meantime, EPA is moving ahead to control greenhouse gas emissions by regulation, not the optimal approach. But if we can't get a price on carbon, we're going to do what we can with the powers we've got. The President intervened personally to salvage a tolerable outcome, not the outcome we had hoped for, but at least a tolerable outcome in Copenhagen last December. We have been elevating energy and climate cooperation in our international activities, uh, ranging from the G8, the G20, the Strategic and Economic Dialogues, been revitalizing ministerial level uh, cooperation on science and technology with Brazil, China, India, Japan, Korea, and Russia. That was another instruction of the President to me very early in the administration to rebuild these science and technology cooperative activities and climate and energy are front and center in those activities. New bilateral clean energy projects with China and India are emerging. Let me turn finally to the roles of fission and fusion. Some of this will be review, I know, to many people in the room, but I will say a little bit at the end uh, about what I personally think about where we're, where we're headed here. The current contribution, uh, about 440 reactors in the world. The percentage of the world's electricity has actually been falling. In 2009, it was down to 13 percent. A few years ago, it was 16 or 17 percent. So we're not going in the right direction in terms of an increasing share of nuclear, although the number of reactors is slowly increasing. If we complete the ones that are currently under construction around the world, the total will be about 500 reactors and a little over 430 electrical gigawatts. In the United States, we still have 104 operating power reactors. They're generating about 20 percent of U.S. electricity. In the United States, as of the 1st of October, we had one more under construction, nine additional planned for another 13 uh, electrical gigawatts. Uh, worldwide, most of those reactors are light water uh, reactors. The rest mainly heavy water reactors, gas-cooled reactors, uh, and graphite-moderated reactors. If we ask what is going to govern the expandability of nuclear energy, both in the United States and worldwide, there are several obvious factors. One is what happens to the demand uh, for electricity. How much economic growth is there going to be? How rapidly will the electrification of economies around the world proceed? Particularly there, how rapidly will we electrify transportation? How rapidly will we introduce uh, electric vehicles? Also depends on the success of uh, improvements in end use efficiency. And a second point in demand is the ability of nuclear energy to deliver non-electricity energy products. Uh, its potential for expansion is greater if it can deliver uh, high temperature process heat and hydrogen, for example, as well as electricity. In terms of economics, many factors are germane. The cost of electricity, the cost just of construction, the risk premium, how much more it costs you to finance a nuclear plant because those investments are still considered risky. The unit size, how big does a nuclear reactor have to be because that affects the lumpiness of the investment. Does an electric utility have to bet the company to build one? Or can you make them smaller? And of course, the economics of competing sources. What is solar going to cost? What is clean coal, or cleaner coal, one would more accurately say, going to cost? Resource availability, how much uranium is out there? What is the supply of uranium versus the cost? And what will the supply of uranium and its cost 
uh, do in terms of uh, our choices of fuel cycles and the kinds of reactors we use. Safety and environment. What's germane there, and this comes back to David Rose's question, compared to what, in which he was one of the uh, masters of forcing people to confront that question. The comparison in terms of safety and environment with the alternatives, both in fact and in perception. Uh, that means uh, radioactive wastes and reactor safety on the nuclear side versus air pollution, climate change, and land use, which are the principal liabilities of much of the competition. In international security, there are issues of dependence and independence, where generally nuclear energy is seen as an asset, because even if everybody doesn't have uranium, it's quite easy to, to store. And on the other side, the question of nuclear weapon proliferation, which Mrs. Rose mentioned in her uh, opening remarks. If you look at the economics question, this is from the MIT Future of the Nuclear Fuel Cycle study of 2010. Basically, what it shows is in economic terms, the fossil fuels, uh, the main fossil fuels used for electricity generation, coal and natural gas, are still cheaper than nuclear energy, although there are two things that could change that. One would be a significant carbon charge, and the other would be if the risk premium uh, for building nuclear reactors were to be taken away and the cost of financing equalized. And uh, those are the bases of two thrusts in administration uh, energy policy. One thrust is financial incentives which have the effect, loan guarantees, uh, that have the effect of uh, neutralizing the risk premium and an effort to get a price on carbon, uh, which would be what we need. Uh, I'd suggest that carbon charges uh, in the range of the $25 per ton of CO2 uh, that, is, that is indicated here is what it would take um, to uh, make nuclear competitive with coal, although still not with natural gas except at high natural gas prices are highly likely by 2025. All the recalcitrants of the current Congress notwithstanding, I personally believe we're going to have carbon prices that high or higher uh, in the next 15 years. Another interesting point is that small modular reactors might be able to drop the, well, certainly could drop the unit cost, that is, how much it costs to build one reactor, because they're much smaller, but might even be able to drop the cost uh, of electricity. In terms of uranium reserves and resources, here I'm in complete agreement with the uh, MIT uh, nuclear, nuclear studies. There are various estimates of how much uranium uh, is out there. But if you look at how much uh, ordinary, once through, light water reactors could afford to pay for uranium and still be more economical than more advanced reactors and fuel cycles, the answer is there's probably something like 100 million tons of uranium out there. That was the conclusion of the 2010 MIT study. That was the, my own conclusion from a study of this that we conducted at the little church school up the street a few years ago. Um, and if you look at the, uh, at the implications of that amount of uranium, 100 million tons of uranium would uh, provide uh, over 100 years of uranium to a world that had 3,500 large nuclear reactors, 3,500 gigawatts in it. That's a huge amount. We're not going to get there uh, any time, uh, probably in this, in this century. So running out of uranium is certainly not uh, the issue. What the uh, 2003 MIT study did then is uh, looked at a number of alternatives for how much nuclear power there might be. <clears throat> depending on the rate of growth of electricity as a whole and the rate of uh, uh, increase of the nuclear market share. At the time they did this study, the market share was about 17%. So they started with that. As I mentioned, it's unfortunately gone down. But they looked for different rates of growth of electricity out to 2050. They looked at what if market share for nuclear energy stays at 17%, what if it goes to 20, what if it goes to 25? And the number of nuclear, uh, number of electrical gigawatts or nominal large one gigawatt nuclear power reactors in 2050 then ranges from 650 compared to about 440 today to 1,500 and some, almost four times what we have today. And to understand what that means, one can do some interesting calculations. What I looked at here is uh, consider 
1700 number, a little higher than the high MIT range for 2050, which is halfway to uh, a world of 3500 gigawatts in 2100, or about 10 times more in 2100 than we had in 2000. And to get a sense of the size of that operation, if you look at the enrichment that they would require, and then ask, what does that mean for proliferation? If a tenth of a percent of that enrichment work were devoted, or diverted, you might say, to the production of highly enriched uh, uranium, that would make enough for 20 to 80 bombs. So that means you can't afford to have a tenth of a percent of the enrichment uh, diverted. If half of those reactors were recycling the plutonium, the associated flow of separated, directly weapon-usable plutonium would be 170,000 kilograms a year, which means that diversion of a tenth of a percent of that would be enough to make 30 implosion-type plutonium bombs. That's unacceptable. We can't have diversion of even a tenth of a percent if we were in a large plutonium recycle economy. In terms of spent fuel production, uh, those reactors on the current fuel cycle would make about 34,000 tons of spent fuel per year, which would be a nominal Yucca Mountain every two years if Yucca Mountain were going to exist and if it stuck to its nominal capacity of 70,000 metric tons of fuel. That just gives you a sense of scale. Look at safety and environment. Reactor safety in a world of 1,700 or more reactors would probably be considered adequate if we could keep the probability of a major core melt accident to the range of 10 to the minus 6, that is 1 in a million per reactor per year. That's probably already achieved by the best current designs, at least in the absence of somebody deliberately attacking and or trying to sabotage uh, the reactor. We might need some additional effort uh, against that last possibility. Uh, radioactive wastes, uh, I would suggest, have to be shown to be manageable without significant worker or public radiation exposure in the short to medium term with the expectation of a problem-free permanent solution in the long term. I think this is clearly achievable technically, uh, relying, uh, again, as the MIT study recommended, on centralized engineered interim storage in the short to medium term. But getting it right technically doesn't necessarily mean we will win public approval, and that remains uh, remains a challenge. In terms of proliferation, uh, I believe we need to, to increase uh, what we call proliferation resistance uh, by a combination of technical and institutional means. In the short term, I think what is required is avoiding the use of highly enriched uranium, uh, minimizing uh, the proliferation of enrichment facilities by offering f enriched fuel on attractive terms and establishing fuel banks so countries are assured that they can get at it. Minimizing the inventories of separated plutonium by minimizing reprocessing and maximizing plutonium dis disposition, getting rid of the stuff, and by improving the protection and safeguards for all of the stocks of both highly enriched uranium and plutonium that remain. In the longer run, I think we have a number of, of uh, choices that we may well uh, need to embrace. One would be avoiding uh, plutonium recycle uh, indefinitely uh, or uh, avoiding plutonium recycle in forms where the plutonium is completely separated from uh, fission products and other actinides. Uh, that's the second thing, develop recycle technologies that don't completely separate it. And a third possibility would be placing uh, in the long run all enrichment and reprocessing facilities uh, under international management. Uh, and uh, protection. Now, I'm running very short on time. I want to very quickly uh, simply point out that the studies that MIT uh, has conducted uh, on the future of nuclear energy, the 2003 study, the 200, 2009 update of that, and the 2010 study whose, whose summary volume is now out on the nuclear fuel cycle, has, in my judgment, reached all the right conclusions. And believe me, I'm circulating these widely in Washington, um, the, uh, we should be uh, accelerating the next generation uh, of nuclear orders uh, with uh, basically approaches that, uh, that reduce the risk premium. Uh, the once through fuel cycle is uh, what we ought to be using for the foreseeable future. Uh, we need uh, better planning for long-term managed storage of spent nuclear fuel. 
we should be moving already to uh, centralized spent nuclear fuel storage sites. Uh, we should be pursuing fuel leasing options for countries with small nuclear programs. Uh, <clears throat> we need to do more research on innovative reactor and fuel cycle options uh, for the future. Uh, <clears throat> in the long run, it is surely possible to do better uh, than the current variants. We should be uh, doing R&D to improve the repository options for long-term storage of waste. And again, we should be pursuing uh, these leasing programs. Turn finally very quickly to fusion. And the question I sometimes get asked, is it worth the trouble? Or another way of asking that question is, is it worth the money? Uh, what are the reasons for having fusion? Well, the fuel supply is much larger than for fission, as we saw. But that's really not much of an advantage, because the fuel supply for fission is already so huge. Ask a policymaker what the difference is between 10 million years worth of fuel and 10 billion years. And uh, you know, policymakers' time scales are generally two, four, and six years. Uh, difference between 10 million and 10 billion is not a huge uh, asset. Cost, the fuel costs will be negligible for fusion, but the engineering complexity, materials requirements, likely high replacement rate of neutron damage components mean that the construction costs and the non-fuel operation and maintenance will probably uh, more than offset that advantage. There may be very clever approaches to fusion still to be discovered for which that won't be true. But based on current designs, it's not likely to cost much less than fission, if less at all. In terms of accidents and sabotage, uh, it is still possible to get significant radioactivity releases with fusion, uh, partly from tritium and partly in some cases from activate, neutron activated materials. But very large releases are less likely by accident and harder to cause by sabotage because the volatile radioactivity is much smaller. The fusion uh, radioactive afterheat is smaller, and a runaway reaction is highly improbable. Uh, that has led to calculations, uh, some of which I and, and Mujid Kazemi, who's here, uh, were involved in in the, in the late 80s and early 90s, suggesting that the uh, worst possible accident from a, a deuterium-tritium fusion reactor would be uh, two to a hundred times, and I tend to lean toward the hundred uh, in terms of the kinds of reactors we'd actually be likely to deploy, smaller than for a fission reactor of the same size. I mean, clearly the quest to control fusion has attracted a lot of effort and quite a lot of money because of the enormous fuel supply. The likelihood that fusion reactors will be safer, will generate less troublesome radioactive waste, easier to safeguard than fission uh, for a whole variety of reasons. Above all, in a normally operating fusion power plant, there wouldn't be any fissile material at all. It would have to be substantially modified to produce any. And of course, part of the attraction is the science and technology involved are fascinating. Uh, but the technical challenges of getting there remain very large. Uh, we've invested more than $20 billion in fusion R&D worldwide to date. It's likely that at least another 30 to 40 billion and 30 to 40 more years will be needed uh, before fusion is able to contribute to electricity supply. And we're not certain it will then. The challenges are very large. Uh, we have made a lot of progress. If you look at the progress in fusion power uh, from the early 70s to the mid-90s, the rate of improvement actually exceeded Moore's law, uh, uh, generally applied to semiconductors. Unfortunately, the absolute level of achievement at the end of that period was still below what is needed uh, for energy break even. The, the, the best performance of the JET, the Joint European Tokamak, the current world record holder, was it very briefly uh, was able to generate uh, about two-thirds of what had to be supplied to it um, to heat and maintain the plasma. So still a loser. ITER, the next generation, uh, shown in this ancient diagram from a PCAST study in 1995, as uh, being available around 2010 is now not expected until 2018. So this curve gets even flatter in terms of the next, uh, the next level of performance. There's been a lot of, a lot of progress, but uh, we still have a ways to go. There's a good case for it, in my judgment. Uh, and the case is, is summarized here. We don't have that many long-term alternatives. I was talking about what we have to do by 2050. You have to ask yourself, what are we going to do for an encore after 2050? It would be very nice to have fusion 
in that mix, and given its potential advantages over other alternatives, summarized here, uh, I think it's worth the money. Uh, my personal judgment is that we should be investing the money, uh, and we are continuing to do it in the United States and in other countries, but it remains controversial. And it's hard to justify as much as fusion costs and will cost when all we're spending on all energy R&D together is five to eight times as much as we need to be spending on fusion, when fusion's probably not going to generate a commercial kilowatt hour until 2050 or later. The solution to that, in my view, is not to stop research on fusion. It's to ramp up the amount of energy we're spending on, the amount of money we're spending on energy R&D altogether. And again, that's what a new PCAST report, which Ernie Meniz has co-chaired, uh, will shortly be out recommending. It's what the uh, odd couple of the American Enterprise Institute and the Brookings Institution uh, just recommended. It's what uh, PCAST recommended uh, in the Clinton administration. It's what President Obama said he wanted to do during the campaign and has said since, 15 billion a year rather than 4 billion a year on uh, energy technology R&D. If we did that, we could afford to find out whether we can make fusion work and do the other things that we need to do as well. And I think that's where we should be going. Thank you very much. No, thank you. Back to yeah. So we have a, a short amount of time for questions. And because it's short, let me ask people uh, who do want to ask questions, first of all, to use the mics. But secondly, please keep it to one idea. Please keep it short, and please make it a question. Thank you. <laughs> yeah, you're right there by the mic. Um, there's an old mantra that says, uh, think globally and act locally. But most people in the US and probably the world think and react locally first. And that means if their jobs are disappearing, they reach out to the nearest uh, irritant uh, to look for some kind of solution. Is there any way you think to be able to link the energy future and some of the dire predictions that you've made to the loss of real um, job security, uh, a feeling of, of, of health and welfare um, for people so that, in fact, that can be a driver uh, in the way it's very much a political driver and will be next week. Well, well I think there is a way to make that connection, and, and, and the president and many people in his administration have been trying to make it, although not with great resonance. And that is, again, that what we need to be doing in terms of investments in our energy infrastructure, investments in cleaner and more efficient energy technologies, uh, these are job-creating investments that we need to be making. Uh, we need to be investing uh, in rail in this country. That would be a job-creating enterprise. We need to be investing in more efficient buildings. That creates jobs. We need to be investing in energy research development and demonstration. That creates jobs. Uh, we need to develop better ways to uh, manufacture things in this country, which are better not simply in terms of how much ener energy they use and how much material they use, but are better in terms of using our inherent uh, advantages in this country to keep more of the value added here rather than having it go overseas. We were talking about these, some of these approaches earlier today in, in side meetings uh, around this event. I, I expect that MIT is going to be a leader in thinking about precisely this question of how we develop better approaches to manufacturing, better approaches to clean and efficient energy, uh, better approaches to investing in adaptation to the climate change we can't avoid that are going to be uh, approaches that create jobs rather than uh, export them or lose them. I have we have people lined up at sorry. microphones, so I guess we go over Simple here. question, Joe. Uh, international cooperation is very important. What do you think about the passage of so-called one, two, three legislation to collaborate with the Russian? You know, we cannot exchange equipment. Uh, it's really a hindrance. Not having yeah, there are, there are lots of hindrances. I mentioned, uh, thank you for that question, Bruno. I mentioned that the president charged me very early in the administration 
with building up this cooperation. And one of the things we quickly discovered is there are a variety of impediments in the way. Some of them are impediments in the form of export controls. Some of them are impediments in the form of visa requirements. Some of them are uh, impediments in terms of tax policy, either in our country or in other countries. I've been working particularly closely with the Russian Minister of Science and Education, Andrei Fursenka, yes. and trying to get some of, these, uh, some of these obstacles beaten down. We actually have a charge from the two presidents, Medvedev and Obama, to, to, to get rid of these impediments as quickly as we can. And with the help of that mandate from the presidents, I think we're going to succeed. Thank you. On this side. Yes, I, I was wondering if you could address uh, what I believe to um, be a, a large public perception challenge in the sense that, one, we have a growing scientific literacy gap in the United States, particularly in our younger population. Two, we have a large um, oil lobbying industry that's able to, for example, um, put Proposition 23 in the state of California on the ballot and label it as the California Jobs Initiative, uh, when in fact it just means to stop uh, any sort of climate change efforts in the state of California. And third, from my limited experience, to be what seems to be the largest population of climate change deniers um, in the United States versus other countries. How do you and your um, and the Office of the President uh, seek to address these challenges of public perception in trying to promote uh, some of the things you've talked about today? Well, th this is a large and complicated question, and there's a short-term part to it and a long-term part. We take the long-term first. We do have a problem of scientific literacy in this in this country, and the president places a very high priority on lifting the level of our science, technology, engineering, and math education at every level from preschool to grad school. He has often said that he thinks this is the single most important thing we could do for the future of our country, is improve the level of, of science and engineering capability and, and literacy. And that's not just in order to have the next generation of inventors and innovators and makers and builders and Nobel Prize winners, but it's to have the technology savvy workforce that we need to be competitive in the 21st century, and it's to have the science savvy citizenry that we need to have citizens be effective in a democracy in which more and more of the issues in the policy arena have science and technology component. And we are not doing well, uh, as we can tell in the United States at the moment, where you have the number of people who believe that climate change is a real and compelling problem has actually fallen from about 85% a few years ago to somewhere between 50 and 70, depending on which poll you believe, uh, as a result of a bunch of nothing burgers in the form of stolen emails and, and rather minor uh, mistakes in the thousands and thousands of pages of the Intergovernmental Panel on Climate Change's uh, summaries. And you have such fundamental misunderstandings, and people actually imagine that the IPCC is the source of our knowledge about climate change, rather than understanding that the source of our knowledge is the mountain of peer-reviewed literature that's been produced by climate scientists over decades, of which the IPCC is only the summarizer and interpreter. Um, we have to get better at telling that story. We have to get better at explaining to people, for example, that the temperature of the Earth is like the temperature of your body. When your body temperature goes up two degrees Celsius, you know you have a problem because your body temperature is telling you something about the state of the system. It's just an index, a proxy. Same is true of the average temperature of the Earth. And when it goes up two degrees Celsius, it's telling us we have a problem in terms of the state of the climate system. There are ways to explain this to the public, but we haven't gotten very good at them. And the president, in fact, when PCAST met with the president some months ago to talk about this very topic, the president said to PCAST, you people have to get better at telling this story. You have to get better at explaining this. You have to get out there more so that people come to understand that uh, the, the deniers are um, sort of in the same position that people who denied that cigarette smoking caused lung cancer were uh, a couple of decades ago. The evidence is overwhelming to the contrary. But, but most people don't understand very much about the nature of science or the nature of evidence, and so we have a steep, uh, a steep hill to climb. We also have, I think, a real challenge that comes from the fact that so many of our media love controversy, that they will give equal time to opposite sides of anything, uh, no, no matter what uh, the balance of respectable opinion and analysis is. And we have a problem, I think, with money in our political system. 
uh, which you also alluded to in, in your question. Uh, you know, the president thought the Citizens United decision of the Supreme Court was so bad that he chastised the Supreme Court in his State of the Union message to the discomfort of, of uh, some of the members uh, sitting there. Uh, I agree with that. I think we have a terrible situation where unlimited amounts of money can be poured into political campaigns and people don't even know who provided it. Uh, when there's no transparency and no accountability in that sense, you're going to have a lot of nonsense out there uh, being paid for by folks uh, with particular agendas. Uh, this side. Hi, quick question. Would a national broadband plan have a major impact on scientific research? That's a really good question. I think we need a national broadband plan and I think that better broadband would certainly have a positive impact in a variety of ways. I don't really have an intelligent opinion about how much it would uh, improve the pace of discovery and innovation in science and technology. There would be an improvement uh, in the productivity of, of the science and engineering enterprise, but I can't, I can't say by how much. I don't know if anybody can. You got an answer to that, Richard? <laughs> Over here. Uh, lo looking at the massive expansion of the uh, nuclear energy sectors in, in India, in China, in uh, South Korea, do you think the U.S. will be likely to uh, be able to retain um, the, the, their current position of, of uh, being technology leaders in that domain? And is that actually your objective to retain that position? I, I think for a whole variety of reasons, the United States uh, needs to stay at the cutting edge of nuclear technology. And in order for us to do that, it would be nice if we had a domestic nuclear industry uh, building uh, nuclear power plants uh, in, in this country. I would like to see that happen. Steve Chu would like to see it happen. The president would like to see it happen, not least because if I didn't make that clear enough in, in this talk, although nuclear energy is not a panacea for the climate problem, there is no panacea it could make a significant contribution if we could make it expandable again. It would be easier to solve the climate problem with the help of nuclear energy than without it. And I think it's in our interest, therefore, to help ourselves and help the rest of the world figure out how to get that done with the appropriate technologies, the appropriate training, the appropriate regulations. And, um, you know, if you look at China and India, South Korea, they are uh, expanding their nuclear operations rapidly. It will be a long time before they're as big even as the U.S. nuclear operation is today. We still have the most nuclear reactors in the world, the most nuclear kilowatt hours in the world. People say, oh, France is the leader. They get 78% of their electricity from nuclear energy. But we generate more than twice as many nuclear kilowatt hours as France does. Uh, we get a smaller percentage of our electricity because our electricity pie is so much bigger. So the United States is not yet in any danger of being uh, left in the dust in this domain, but we've got to pay attention. We've got to make the investments. We've got to do what needs to be done to create the environment in which this technology becomes uh, expandable again. Last question. Um, okay, a lot has been said about global responsibility and um, how the U.S. can be a leader in actually leading the world to reduce um, climate change and um, go into greener technology. So my question is, would it be feasible to actually move beyond just nuclear investment and nuclear deals with foreign countries and move into actually investing in alternative energy technology and uh, other such, such as solar energy, wind energy? And um, do you think that the U.S. would have the funds or the incentive to do these things? Oh, absolutely. I mean, again, uh, I hope I made clear that there is no silver bullet, that we can't do only one thing. We need the renewables. We need increased efficiency. We need clean biofuels. We need uh, better fuel cells. We need electric vehicles. We need more wind turbines. We need cheaper photovoltaic cells. We're investing in all of those things. We should be investing much more. When I talk to my counterparts in other countries, and I have met with the science ministers of India, of Russia, of China, of Japan, of South Korea, of Brazil, uh, among many others, Everybody puts at the top of the list of the topics on which they want to cooperate the following four. Clean energy, climate change, sustainable agriculture, and public health, biomedicine and public health. There are other issues, 
Some want to cooperate on nanotech. Some want to cooperate on infotech. But everybody in that group wants to cooperate on clean energy, on climate change, on sustainable agriculture, and public health. And we're doing it. We are building cooperation with India and with China in renewables, not, not just in nuclear uh, energy. We're building cooperation with them on more efficient vehicles, on more efficient buildings. And we've got to do it all. Uh, if you look at the magnitude of the challenge and the amount by which uh, we need to reduce the ratio of greenhouse gas emissions to useful energy supplied to the economy, we can leave no stone unturned. And that's what we're trying to get done. Thank you very much.